Hello, Jay. You there? Hey, Siri, pause the music. Hey, Kevin. Oh, I just, uh, I think I figured out how to get in. So uh, uh, we just started. Yeah, it took, it took well, I got, uh, we're, we're going and we are recording. I don't know how to turn that off. Let's, let's see. Okay. Okay. Well, if anybody has a problem, let me know and we'll, uh, we won't post it. Okay. It's, block. it's just a block of wood to get the, the router bit to zero. And I'm doing this by feel. It's right there. And if you come over and look at the visual readout, I did this before, I'm actually off by, now the router bit is exactly zero uh, height. Now, I've already adjusted the fence. And the first thing we're going to do is uh, uh, go ahead and cut our first path. Bring them back a one inch radius round over. We're going to adjust the router bit down, not make one big cast on this at one time. You got to, got to show the, the tag on your router. <laughs> Okay. Bench cookies. Lucky I didn't go too far. Why wouldn't you do that first? The next thing we're going to do is go over to the table saw and remove this material right here to, to finish off the uh, So I will lower the blade down to. I'm going to go a little bit lower just to be on the safe side. And I'm going to bring the fence over. Now, normally I'd set up some data blades to do this, but <laughs> I think I smashed on that too. So. Now, why don't you cut it all the way off? Well, I need this surface here obviously keep it stable when I'm cutting. So I had to make it wider. I just happen to have this board. It doesn't have to be this wide, but um, it was just convenient to do it. Now what I'll do is come back and trim this off this way. 
depending on the cabinet that I'm going to make them. I may want to take a little bit more out of here. And, um, but it would basically be how far do I want the handle to stick out plus the uh, thickness of the drill. So it, uh, it may end up being two inches or whatever, to, but you can see here, it makes a nice form. Now there is some concern about grain wrenches. Um, <clears throat> this technically could break with the grain running in this direction. The best way to make these would be going with the end grain, and, uh, but you need a wider board. It's a little dangerous to be running this through your table saw. So I've uh, chosen to do it this way, but um, I'll just come back here and clean this off with a, a card scraper or a rasp or something, and then just cut a data cut. And so this would be enough to make about four drill plus. You want to make 10, make your circle wood longer. That's all. This happened to be a piece of metal. Okay. okay, thanks, Ed. Okay. Thanks, guys. Have a good evening. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> I have a whole bunch of them. You just made me nervous. I just had to close my eyes. I, I just, oh my God. I've taken no. care of too many hand injuries in my life. So anyways. Yeah. yeah I know. I you know, so far, so No, good. you're right. I, I'm not arguing with you. I've just been doing this for so long. It feels more comfortable rather than having all these. I do use them on the table saw though. I, I have used them, but this piece here is wide enough that I felt comfortable. Well, I wasn't putting my hands in danger. It's just me. Um, uh, also, I found with those um, those micro jig things that you're pushing it through, but you can't push it up against the fence. You don't have your hand. It's it's pushing. It's awkward. I don't want this thing to go out from the router table and catch inside here and throw it across the room. Yeah, touche. So I just feel more comfortable doing it uh, by hand. Anytime I'm worried about something like that, I'll throw a feather board in the, in the T-track and it holds it nice against the fence. Yeah. But I, I agree with you. But the, the as you know, the micro jig has little feet on the end, so it helps uh -huh. scoot your piece through. And it, if the board blows up, it doesn't get... Um, I do have a philosophy. I do mentally, quickly stand back and say... Is this safe? What's going to bite it, me? Yeah. I, something doesn't feel comfortable about this. Yeah. Uh, so I I push. I will use push sticks on the table saw, and I've got the uh, the the micro jig uh, things and everything. It's mostly where I don't feel comfortable with it, and uh, uh, that's all. It's just a personal thing. Well, I have no. Thanks way. for thanks for asking. <laughs> yeah, I have no place to t tell the master how to do it, but. No, just, no, no, no. You're absolutely right, but I just, it, I just had to, I just had to be candid with you. I had to close my eyes. I was so worried about your hand. Yeah, you know, I don't use a guard on my table saw. I found that it was more of a pain in the neck having the thing, and yeah. it's just, you know, my hands are there and the guards there, and it's like, what is better here? Yeah, you know, I just didn't feel comfortable with it, so I don't use a guard. My table saw is set up so perfectly, I. I just don't have any kickback. I don't have that problem. So, you know, when you, when you say guard, do you mean get into you another use subject about? Hmm? Par pardon me. Do you use a riving knife? A do you use a, a, a splitter, riving knife? No, no. Why? Never. Oh, okay. No, I don't have a problem with it. Yeah. My saw is is dialed in within accuracy on the fence of one thousandth of an inch, parallel with the blade. I just run stuff through there. I've never, I just don't have a problem. If your fence isn't uh, parallel with the blade, I, I've i done the two, three degrees out or three thousandths out and all this other mumbo jumbo. I found perfectly parallel and good dry wood. If your wood has moisture yeah. in it, you're going to get the boards where they pinch. They're going to, the, the stress in the board is going to, it, it's yeah, going to, yeah. And you can run into, I use wood that's less than 6% moisture. So, um, so uh, we'll have to drink some wine and talk about this further. I don't want to dominate the meeting here. No, no, I, you're, uh, that, that's what this is for, is to, to bring up these kinds of things. Yeah. Now, I have mm -hmm. two table saws. They're identical. One I use strictly for ripping, and I use a, a riving knife uh, on that saw. And then I have another that I... I use strictly for um, mm -hmm. um, cross, -cut. cross cut. I don't have one on that. Uh, so I do tend, you know, I'll, I prefer the 6% wood or under 10% under wood, mm -hmm. but because of the rescue woods and all that, I am using woods that are marginal, marginally dry. Some of them are, you know, if I showed you, I'll, I'll, I'll do a video of my wood, my uh, eucalyptus wood storage. And while I'm talking about, why don't you go get your rocking chair? Oh, the progress. Oh, yeah. real quick. We didn't do the disclaimer. These are the opinions, the opinions. of the three guys, these morons sitting behind the table, okay? <laughs> and um, what I do isn't cast in stone or yeah. it isn't the Bible, okay? So there's a lot of um, safety things that, uh, it, you know, you can read up on all of them and do yeah. all those things that are recommended and... Uh, as they say, God love you. Yeah, uh, do, learn, do do use, what you feel comfortable with. Okay. Use your machines to yeah, your comfort level, and and I, I have to say, you know, knock on wood. I, I 
before I make any cut on the table saw, especially, uh, but all of the, the equipment, I always, it, it just, I don't know where it came from, but I always ask myself, do you know where all of your fingers are? <laughs> I, I, I say that it's, it's a device. It froze. Device, so you know, but understand. Yeah, you okay. froze. Then it's froze. Froze. What you, what's that? You froze. Okay. We froze. Uh, it, it's back now for me. Yeah, yeah. It, it it should. Hey, it's as good as I can get. So, can I ask one more question on the handle? Sure. Sure. Um, Ed, the one that you have in your hand with the curves, did you do the curve part on a bandsaw or how did, or uh, how did you... uh, uh, this little curve right here? Yeah. 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 Uh, well, you can rough cut it out on the bandsaw. And then if you have a spindle uh, sander, you can just sit there and, and um, but uh, yeah, this was just cut out on a bandsaw and I just had the, uh, I think I drew a little curve here and, and just uh, cut it out and then sanded it, uh, I finished sanding it. One thing about using a bandsaw, Michelle, is don't rely on the blade to cut everything just pristine, you know, like 800 grit, you know, it, you're gonna get um, saw thing. marks and, uh, and uh, so you need to cut outside the line a little bit and then, and then finish sanding it, so. Okay, Joan, take it away. Oh, I'm good. All right, well. You want to move center stage? Yeah, sure. I think the last time I showed where my progress was, what did I have? I had my 10 inch degree template, right? Yeah. And I was cutting. I'm going to zoom in. Cutting these angles at 10 inch degrees. It is a dovetail. So I now have all four legs cut and fit, depending on the temperature and the humidity. Right. <laughs> I guess we should zoom out. Uh, I will zoom out. There we go. Cooper. Cooper. And this is uh, all from one piece of eucalyptus and then this is George pile that he'll show you guys. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a picture of my eucalyptus pile net for next week. Show them that the Dutch are right. Can you do that? It's, it's heavy. It's quite better. heavy. The, the design criteria was 500 pounds. <laughs> Where are your drawings, Joan? <laughs> He's got actually, some really cool sketches. I actually do have sketches for this one. But not drawings. Yeah, no renderings. No renderings. And I was in your shop and I, I had come with, I had come up with how I wanted to Cooper to get the seat shape. And mm -hmm. I, I was in your shop and I saw one of your seats and it was exactly what I had finally figured out. I was like, man, I, I just... <laughs> <laughs> just yeah, have draw, I have a drawing <laughs> for it. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, this is where I am next. I need to um, start on those rockers. Yeah. Well, how are you going to do the rockers? How am I going to do the rockers? Make a drawing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to figure out how I want to join this leg to the rockers. This angle is going to get cut square to kind of match this angle. But I'm going to, I guess, leave some type of material <laughs> for some type of joint to keep my 500 pound weight capacity. So, um, Joe, I have questions for you. So, you know, I'm yes. doing the, uh, the cello chair, and there are some pieces that you can run through the bandsaw to help with the sculpting of the seat base. Some yes. pieces on my chair, you, you couldn't do that. You could cut a little bit out of it and some of them you couldn't cut any out, you have to sculpt. Are you planning to sculpt with the bandsaw for all of those? It looks like you can do it on pretty much all of them. 
Um, I use the bandsaw to cut my dovetails and to cut everything close. I'm probably going to make a template out of this piece. This is the only thing that's glued up right here. This, these two spines. Oh, man. And you, yeah. you see my little drawing here. I'll probably make a template out of the plywood. I mean, not plywood. What was that? My pine, my pine prototype. And then Ben saw this close and then use the router to get them perfect on a router table. Then, um, then I, uh, I'm thinking about adding armrests. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Are you gonna Are you gonna template everything, Jim, so that you can replicate it if you need to, or or not? Yes. You are. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I am. Because I do plan on selling more of these. Um, this one is for me, the eucalyptus one. Um, the original prototype, I didn't feel like that. Finishing. I felt like if I was going to put some time yes. into it, yes. I would do it out of something that I could actually show. And I think that I think I think that having a cheaper material just doesn't do the design justice. Um, so this is going to be my personal um, one-off, but I'll have templates so that if anyone wants this chair and any material, I can recreate it. And then I had. Three, I'm gonna make two of my my prototypes. The other one I think I'm gonna do in the one game. And those will be my personal examples. Put them in some shows. Yeah. So what I have till the 28th, I believe, to finish this one. Yeah, Friday, <laughs> next Friday. Yeah, so I have cool. to wrap this up. Any questions on what uh, Joan's doing? Uh, any thoughts on how you're gonna finish it? Um, what do you mean? Like how I'm going to... Yeah, what product are you going to use on it to finish it? Oh, I'm going to use the same oil, sand it down to however many thousands Ed recommends. What? 10,000? 3,000. Okay, 3,000 and yeah. the oil finish. There's already oil. The, uh, uh... Oh, and then Dennis says... This is from the same tree, actually. Yeah, all this is from the same uh, stuff. This is this is three thousand. Is beautiful with the just the now. I don't use a standard uh, mix. This this finish I use is uh, just varnish and linseed oil with enough mineral spirits to make it flow. I, I don't use tongue on. Sometimes I, I just it depends on the the piece. I wanted the, the grain on this is really tight. So the heavy, thicker stuff wouldn't penetrate. So I, I cut it almost uh, quite a bit. But that, I mean, mm -hmm. this wood, this will look like that. Yeah, and the camera doesn't do it any justice, honestly. Yeah, yeah. It really doesn't. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful piece. You know, that's an interesting question about, I've always been perplexed about when I polish a piece of furniture to three or 4,000 grit, I've been told you basically close the pores of the wood and I've always wondered how deep the oil penetrates into the wood um, even if you leave it for five minutes or 15 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever I don't have an answer to that and it, um, I think you'd be the perfect person to figure it out yeah. well I don't have a I don't have the equipment quantitatively to cut the piece of wood and measure the depth of the oil because I've been told that the oil isn't penetrating into the surface very deep at all. Yeah. You're kidding yourself. Yeah. But, yeah. So as I've shared with you guys in the past, I use a product called Rubio Monaco uh, 2C with oil. And they tell you, if you sand up, let's say to 220, which is where I usually conclude my sanding, uh -huh. that you actually have to go back to 150 and put some microscopic openings into the wood so that the oil will absorb. So they tell you 220, you're not going to get good absorption. So I dare say at 3,000, you're right. You've probably cleared, you know, uh, absolutely closed the pores of the wood. Yeah. So I don't. I, I would guess that your penetration is pretty minimal. It's more mostly application as opposed to absorption. Well, the only thing that um, I've we I've made bar stool for our kitchen. 
We see it on them every day. Uh, we've been using them for 10 years. They're still as shiny as the day that I put them out there. I mean, we don't abuse stuff. We don't draw, spill liquid on it or anything, but they still look pristine new that the finish looks just like the oil finish I put on there 10 years ago. So um, I'd like to think that my butt's wearing off the oil after 10 years, but it apparently isn't. I, I don't know. I, I'm, I, I've always, I've been using this oil finish for probably 35, probably close to 40 years now. And I would never go back to the yeah. varnishes and all the other, I just love this oil finish. Yeah. Look. I, I just wanted, I don't, again, I don't know if you can see it, but Ed did an experiment at the Maloof a long yeah. time ago and he sanded everything and he did all this stuff and he put motor oil. Or I put mineral oil, motor oil, linseed oil, the olive oil. Uh, I had about 10 different, Steve was there, Steve saw the thing. And the object, objective of my demonstration was, can you tell what kind of oil, what finish I used? And a lot of people couldn't see any difference. Yeah. Even with the motor oil. What? I, I, think, I think it was. Uh, I, I no, I I think I did. I had some I mean, dirty weight water water oil or something. 1040. I'm not recommending yeah, you no, do no, that. No. Okay. The whole thing was that some people get hung up on this thing about oh my god, there's only one way to do this yeah. and there's no other way to do it. Well, you're wrong, and that was the objective of the demonstration. That um, mm -hmm. now these other oils don't give you any really surface protection or, and my attitude is if it was good enough for Sam Maloof to use all these years, good enough for me. Okay, fine. So it's, it, there's a, a number of them on the market now. There's um, tried and true, and they're all just knockoffs of the, um, the, the varnish and the uh, different oil. uh, tongue yeah. oils and different oils and stuff. So. All right, I have a question. Did you compare the wax, the oil wax when you did that? Yes, I used the Howard's. Uh, there was one of them that I used Howard's mm -hmm. orange oil and beeswax, everything looked exactly the same. The, the point I was trying to make is I polished everything to 4,000 grit. And when you held it up to the light, every, every piece of the wood had a reflection on it. Yeah. So the oil finish was more like it brought out the, the grain and the color of the wood, but it didn't do anything to enhance, to differentiate between one and the other. They were very similar. It's kind of like sandpaper. So I'm what's the, yeah, well, that, that well, well, we'll yeah. talk about that later, okay. but oil is oil. Okay. Uh, when, <clears throat> when Ed did his demonstration at the Maloof, uh, in fact, we might, uh, it was really, you gotta, you gotta see it and, and feel it to, to yeah. make any sense. Well, but, got it, but since he did that, I've changed the way that I do inside drawers. Now, linseed oil or any variation can go rancid if it is not exposed to oxygen. It, it, it polymerizes. If, it, if there's a lot of oxygen, it'll polymerize. If there's no oxygen, it will decay. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm using mineral oil on the inside of drawers now. Mm -hmm. But the reason I keep I have this, this guy, here, let me, let me zoom it in. I don't know, it, it, it is absolutely beautiful. Let's see. Uh, and let's see. You can't tell the difference between the outside there, and the inside of the box. There is no finish yeah, I, on the inside of that drawer. It is just simply sanded <clears throat> to 4,000. There's no oil or anything on there. Yeah. I've been using that process also, like on these keepsake boxes because there's a lot of detail down inside the box to get the oil off. The mineral oil will just dry. You wipe it all off, but it'll just dry and it won't be tacky or anything. And it, I got the same appearance and um, that's all. Yeah. So you're saying <clears throat> no oil on the inside of boxes is what you're saying. No linseed oil on the inside of boxes uh, of a drawer that, that does not expose. Now, if you make it, and leave the drawer open for a week or two and let the uh, uh, linseed oil. Steve, you're shaking your head. Um, I, I studied with a guy named Brian Miller, who's like the finishing guy in, in Southern California. And he's like, just don't do it. It runs too much of a risk. Um, do like, don't, just don't use oil, period, on the inside of a box. 
cabinet, anything like that, because uh, it can eventually go bad. I have some furniture my dad made. This is just prior to World War II, and it smells to high heaven on the inside. Mm. We've had to go through it and try to pull stuff off and seal it up with stuff. So it's just, I hmm. personally, again, so I'm the, the, the fourth guy who's just making shit up here. Um, <laughs> I just don't, I just don't do it. Um, uh, uh, um, shellac is fine because it's not going to go bad. And if I want it to yellow, I'll put shellac down. And then um, I just use a clear poly, you know, a plastic based finish. And I don't, I haven't had an issue with it, and it's very hard. And if you want it to stay more white, uh, you just go straight to a, a clear poly finish. It's not yeah. yellow. But that's me. I, yeah. I, I have uh, personally, I've seen uh, furniture that Maloof made, cabinets that Maloof made uh, back in the 50s, and it smells really nice and it's beautiful. So, you know, what works is what you do. Um, question if you if you're using linseed oil does it make a difference if you're using the boiled versus the raw as far as it going rancid uh, I, I haven't I don't have any information or data on that the the boil linseed simply uh, takes long uh, takes shorter time to polymerize so I would say that the the, the, the raw linseed just takes instead of months, or the, in, instead of weeks, it takes months or longer. Uh, so uh, linseed oil is an interesting material. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the boil, we use the boil, uh, I use the boil, and uh, I used to experiment. I, I would put uh, 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 Japan dryers in it, like they do for oil paint, to see if, if that had any, had any effect. But uh, they say that linseed oil doesn't really completely polymerized for years. Hmm. So that 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 is hmm. kind of goes back to what Steve was saying. It, it can go bad. Kind of like spar varnish. Is that the consensus uh, from everyone to use the boiled versus yeah, the I, I would use the boiled. Well, I if you look in Sam Maloof's original book, I don't know, like page 30 or something, he's got the <laughs> recipe in there for it. Yeah. And it says boiled linseed oil. And that I've always used the oil. Yeah. I, yeah, that that's uh, so I, I I don't even I don't know I haven't I haven't seen raw seen linseed oil raw linseed, at least like Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever I don't maybe you can buy it um but in California we can't buy anything anymore okay uh, it's unbelievable what the it, it's crazy so if you really want to find it I think you can find it at a high end art supply store oh, not okay. like Bulls mm -hmm. the you know art yeah. whatever craft yeah. supply but a real a genuine art supply store. Where they're selling stuff to artists, oil paints, and things like that, you will. Uh, I think that's where you'd find it. Oh, okay, yeah, it'd be fun to experiment, but oh, it's fun to experiment. You yeah. can always sand it off and do it over. That's right. What if well, my... I, was gonna... yeah, I have a quick question about uh, so when you have final finish using Sam's uh, magic, you know, stuff, the side table, for example, that we made together at the Barnes, Dennis. Um, some of the boards I can actually feel where they've started to, you can see the, feel the edges if you run yeah. your hand across it. So to get it back to how I want it to be, what grit sand should I use to go back down to? And then what should I get back to before I put more finish on? Okay, excellent question, uh, Trevor. What you're referring to is what, we, what Ed and I and others, we call glue snipe. Basically, at the Maloof, when we did that table, you know, we're under a time crunch. Yeah. And when you put the, when you glue the two pieces of wood together, there's moisture in that uh, glue. The wood swells, right? And then we sand it down to 400. You know, that, that, that was our limit at the Maloof. Yeah. Yeah. And then over a period of time, the wood shrinks, it, it loses the, the moisture, mm -hmm. but the glue is rigid. And what you're feeling is the, uh, the glue that uh, now is proud because the wood has shrunk microscopically. Mm -hmm. And on the good thing about the 400, sanding down to 400, you simply resand it with 400, makes it go away, re-oil it, and it's good to go. Uh, if, you, if we could have waited a week before we applied the oil, that wouldn't happen. Well, it's interesting because you remember the little bar that I made to go on the storm door that had the ebony yeah. inserts in it? 
that has the same thing going on as well, where the ebony inserts are just coming proud now. Uh, yeah, the ebony shrinks less than the, the wood that it's in. So basically the, the wood that the ebony is in has shrunk a lot and the ebony does not shrink. Right. So, you know. Welcome to woodworking. Yeah, that's, that's the fun stuff. That, that's why, that's why they, um, a lot of the ebony stuff, they would leave proud a little bit and put a little round over. So it, it's amazing how time flies. So um, uh, I don't know, you wanna continue or what? If you guys wanna- no, I, have I, I have a question. Sure. Really? <laughs> okay. So, you know, I go to, you know, this uh, small sawmill to buy rough cut wood. Um, now, uh, it varies between a little over three fourths. If I'm lucky, I'll get an inch. And I need to get a, a good two, two inch, I mean, a two inch board. Well, you know, I start and I just kind of plane it down a little bit where, especially where I'm going to glue it. So what do I do to try and get the full two inches? Because it always ends up short of a full two. Because I don't, you know, the wood I get's not always an inch thick. Hmm. Um. So you're trying to have a piece of wood that's two inches thick when you finish. Yes. And you're like starting. Four. Well, the the dilemma is if you buy wood in wood in the rough. Was it you want to say something, Trevor? Or I gotta go. I'm sorry, you guys. Didn't mean to yeah. interrupt. It was going. Yeah, say, if you have to leave, don't Thank feel you. the meeting's over yeah. basically. So well appreciate it. Normally, okay. if you buy lumber in the rough. Uh, eight quarter lumber is a full two inches thick. Now, if you want two inches thick, you'd have to buy 10 quarter yeah. lumber and mill it down to two inches thick. So um, <clears throat> again, a lot of this plays into the, the, um, the condition of the wood. If it's all tweaked and you got to run it across your joiner and planer and you keep playing with it, there's not a lot of room to move. That's, you know, so you end up buying 12 quarter wood to get down to eight quarter, you know? So there's a lot of variables involved in starting and finishing. And unfortunately, when you go to a typical lumber yard, all the lumber is milled to specific dimensions. But the problem is if the board isn't flat, straight and square again, you have to do something with it. And now you're taking it down below. If you wanted an inch and three quarters, which you get at the lumber yard, you're gonna be down to an inch and five eighths or an inch if it's real. So you have to be careful about picking out lumber. You kind of look at it and sight it and you go, oh, that's got a big bow in it. No, I don't want that piece. So there's some variables involved in it, that's all. Um, okay, but that didn't help my problem. <laughs> so, I mean, would I, I, I know this sounds really dumb, but could I uh, have a smaller, like a half inch, like could I glue, cause it'll end up being three quarters. Could I put a half inch and then another three quarter and then sand it or plane it down to the- Do it all the time. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that's how, if we need a, a, a three inch piece of wood, we glue up, we stack it until mm -hmm. you got your dimension and then work it out. Or buy, you know, buy the, you know, the, the rough wood. Uh, I think part of the, work, I understand your dilemma, uh, Michelle, but it all depends on the finished product. Let's say you were gonna do a tabletop that had to be an inch and a half thick and you glued two three quarter pieces together to get that table. Well, now you're gonna see a seam all the way around the table. On the edge. But but you, you could put an edge um, frame around it to hide that. But again, if you want your tabletop to look like a solid three quarter or an inch and a half thick piece of wood, you have to start out with a thicker piece of wood to begin with to achieve that. But if you're going from three quarters down to a half, 
that's a no brainer. I mean, uh, we do that all the time. It's going the other direction that uh, uh, that becomes a problem. Uh, so, okay, yeah. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, just buy, just see if you buy thicker wood. You got to <laughs> talk to your, you got to talk to your lumber guy yeah. and, uh, but go over there with a baseball bat. Okay. And, uh, okay. I'm on, you got to bang two. him across the head a couple of times. Two five quarter. <laughs> Again, this is the Maybe opinion of these opinion. three morons sitting at the table. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. Actually, no. I buy what you want to, to achieve your project. <laughs> That's all. Uh, okay. So, hey, folks, I'm actually going to head out. So yeah. feel free to. Well, I, I think I think we let's conclude this. What do you any suggestions for next week? We'll figure something out if you don't. But any suggestions? You know, uh, there's a lot of experience in this group. Um, yeah. One thing that I always enjoy uh, is listening to people's hacks and or uh, solutions that they've come up with uh, to deal with recurring, you know, headaches in our life. Um, maybe we could all kind of share some hacks or some jig ideas. That's or, a good idea. Yeah. Hacks. Uh, okay. That's great. Next week, let's let's everybody figure out how you fix aggravating things that reoccur. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll bring some. Well, hacks. how many hours are we going to devote yeah. to this? <laughs> yeah, we, we got that. That would be good for like a two Holy or three months. Holy smokes! Where do I start? You know. <laughs> Well, we know our leadership can come up with plenty. Okay, uh, and and I, I I want I'd like for Steve Grezik to to do a little uh, presentation on uh, what what he does. It's really fun, and also Andrew, I haven't forgot you. So, okay, we got to go. Are we going to see that end table of Andrews? Hey, Andrew, the Yemeni's growing mold. Okay, <laughs> oh, I'm relentless. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, I'll get it. We'll, we'll, we'll see y'all later. Good, no problem. Glad to see you guys. And next week, same time, same place. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye. Yeah. How do we turn it off, Joan? <laughs> Goodbye. Everybody, everybody's going to log off, so I guess we're going to be. There we go. Do you have a rubber band or maybe, do you have some shrink wrap? Oh, yeah, I do. I do. No, that's okay. I, 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 I got shrink wrap. Just, just let me remember where it was. Just to wrap it so these things don't go flying off. I have some in, but it probably takes you longer to fall. Oh. Yeah, I got to run. Okay, I do too. Some lady ran into the back of our Lexus and did some damage in our meeting. Her. Yeah, she yeah, I, I don't know exactly. What oh, that's okay. Is that oh, no, 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 it's okay. I can just. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Okay. Audio. Thank you. Yeah. That's, that's good. That's yeah. Cool. Cool. You know, it'd be neat if everybody we were all in the same room together. Oh, how are your routers working out? Everything 